we could call the meeting to order. And I'm Chuck Capetta, Board of Health member. I'm at home by myself and no one around, and I can hear everybody. I'm Dr. Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum, board member. I'm at home by myself. I can hear you, but nobody else can hear us. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. So, in terms of the minutes we had, I was just seeing here. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt, yeah. Chuck. But I, can we say who else is on the phone? Because oh. there's or on the line because there's a couple of phone numbers, and I don't know who those people are. Yes, and thank you. The record. So, uh, well, we Angela and Bob are on the phone. We have. Uh, Alderman Lopez, welcome. How are you? Yes. And How am I ever? <laughs> oh, good. And then, yes, we have a, a 508 0058 and a 781962 are on the line. Hi, this is, this is Alderman Elizabeth Liu. Oh, hi, Alderman. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you. Oh, You're welcome. Nice hi, I'm the 781, and I'm here. And who are you? And who are you? I'm sorry. Oh, Marion Knight, 29 Harris Street. Oh, Just so a member um, of the public. Oh, no, wonderful member of the public. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so welcome. And then we have Justin. Good afternoon. Uh, just another member of the public. Oh, welcome. Nice to have you. And Kim, Kim Houghton. Good afternoon. Yes, Kim Houghton with the union leader. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Welcome to everybody. Thank you. Hope everyone had a good holiday season. So thank you. So let's, I won't, I will pinch it. Um, um, Steph and I will pinch it together here, but we'll go forward without our fearless leader. So um, we'll see you next month. So first order of business looks to be to approve the minutes from March 10th. Um, and that we have in front of us, I printed them out and hopefully you got all the, the minutes, Steph. Um, do you have any comments? Or so the question is, with Bobby unable to attend because of the clinic, et cetera, um, is there someone that is going to be able to do uh, a screen share of the documents for people that may not have them? Or should we just talk through them? Or how will we do this? Good I can show them on my screen. Let me just. Um... Would that be OK, Angela? Yeah, let's see. And, and since we have people on the phone, and since we welcome members of the public, as people speak, uh, I imagine it would be quite helpful if they state who they are and what their role is, even if it's more than once, so the members of the public can follow along most effectively. Great. Okay, so um, this is the Board of Health meeting. And so for Angela, I guess we need to do the meeting ID, or do you want me to do that, or yeah. officially, or passcode? Um, sure. Do you want to read it or do you want? Yeah. So for this is the Board of Health meeting taking place on April 14th. Uh, it's a Zoom meeting still going on as per mandated. And our meeting ID is 863-9978-9686. Passcode is 27, uh, 271193. And if you're joining the meeting um, already uh, or like to in the future here, the next hour, um, it's 1646-876-9923 is the telephone number. And if you have any problems with the audio, it says here to call 603-821-2049. So hopefully that covers the nuts and bolts of how to get the meeting off the ground. Thank you. Dr. Capetta? Yes. Could I interrupt briefly? Would Wait. it be okay to record the meeting for minutes purposes? Oh, yes, please, if that's okay. Is that something you can do, Angela? Um, Angela? is on, right, so. Angela, this is Jeff from CTV, and I am recording it. Okay, so great, you're, thank you. are good. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeff, thank you. So um, we do have then a first order of business. It looks like approval of the minutes uh, for those of us who are here as board members. So. Steph, do you have any comments from our March 10th um, meetings? The meetings are up front on the screen, it appears. No, very, very complete. Thank you. It's Thank a, you. A, a good uh, compilation of all the work that's being done. Excellent. Thank you. So can I have a, um, a motion to approve the minutes? Yes. So Steph, do your motion to approve? Yes. Say aye. I approve. So I approve. Second. Minutes passed. Thank you. So moving on to the director's report, um, 
um, Angela or, or Bob, I'm not sure who's going to take over. So this, um, if you'd like to go forward. Sure. So I can provide the director's report. Um, so the director's report starts off with um, the budgets um, for this FY22 year coming up. Um, and so uh, we did come in at the percentage that the mayor asked um, and we have substantial funding to do what we need to do um, over the next fiscal year. Um, we have the public health emergency preparedness dollars, the substance misuse prevention dollars, um, continuum of care, public health advisory council, and then our MRC or hospital preparedness budgets. Then um, we also submitted our fourth year annual accreditation report. Um, so this is the last report that we'll submit um, before we go into reaccreditation um, this upcoming year. So this was really focused on performance management and quality improvement. Um, and Bobby just put in some of the um, feedback that we got from the accreditation board on our report. Um, and I'll just read this comment. Uh, Nashua DPHES is commended for its work in applying performance management and quality improvement to its COVID response activities. The health department became a strong leader in its role as chief public health strategist and used its expertise to address equity and cultural effectiveness within the region's community leaders. Um, so this is really speaking to our performance management and quality improvement project, which was focused on um, ensuring health equity in regards to COVID-19, specifically with testing and vaccination and um, education services. Um, so that's what most of the report was about. Um, and then some other things from the report, um, they mentioned the community health assessment and um, how we engage community members in regards to the community health assessment, um, our behavioral health services, um, and then also continuing our work with the emerging leaders of public health grant and becoming the chief public health strategists. And then we have our COVID activity. So we pulled together an annual report um, on our COVID activity over the past year. So March 13th, 2020 to March 13th of 2021, because in March we reached our full year of response to the pandemic in Nashua. Um, we had worked collectively as a division, uh, 153 or 15,338 hours um, on COVID-19 response activities. Um, and that included our testing clinic, our hotline coverage, um, disease investigations, all of the work that we've been doing. Um, and then also it includes our organizational meetings with our partners every week. Um, and then Bobby also mentions that um, our vaccination clinics have been ongoing um, and our equity allocation clinics continue weekly. And we've also started our homebound vaccination clinics um, and those visits are provided by our public health nurses. Um, and then um, we have the community health improvement plan, which is picking up. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in my re report, but subcommittees have been formed um, and we're working off of the results of the 2020 community health assessment. Um, and then we continue our personal and professional development activities and webinars and trainings. Um, and then these are Bobby's boards and committees that she's on. Um, she presented at several committee meetings in March um, and then conducted lots of press conferences and media coverage. Um, and then some final highlights, um, the building updates so construction work is on target to be completed by the end of May. Um, and then last week was the 10th annual public health week. Um, so we had a little ceremony with the mayor um, and staff were recognized um, for several awards leading by example above and beyond and making a difference awards. Um, so that was last week. Um, and that's how we kicked off our public health week. And I believe that's it for the director's report. Thank you, Angela. My goodness, my goodness. Summarized a lot, a lot of work here. My goodness. Most impressively, the 15,000 hours. That's that's my. How did you calculate that, just as a curiosity? Did you just? Yeah, so we had um, the nurses' hours specifically, 
it, it's really it's really not an approximate estimation. Um, and then the people who are salary based, um, we gave estimates over the pandemic for the percentage of hours we were working on COVID only activities. Yes. Um, and then we have the hours worked by volunteers. Um, and then like our CDC foundation workers um, and the other like uh, surge staff. So we have the surge staff hours in addition to the regular staff um, hours that were put in. And I'm sure even that number is <laughs> underestimating all your hard work. It's amazing. It's great, great, great. Thank you. Um, and one other question before I ask something else. Oh, what's the homebound vaccination clinic? Did you do COVID there too, or just kind of routine for elderly or like chicken pox or something or what? Yeah, so the homebound vaccination clinics is vaccines for COVID um, for people who can't leave their homes um, to get to a regular vaccine clinic. So one of our public health nurses will go into their home um, and provide them uh, either first dose or second dose um, and then follow up with them a month later. Well, thank you. Oh, Steph, or other board member, or other members of our panel today? Yes, Steph. So I have a number of comments and questions. They may be uh, ripe for answer during other people's reports, but I don't want to lose my threads. So first of all, I, you know, I'll echo what Dr. Capetta said. This is Dr. Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum, board health member, because I did ask for people to introduce oh, yeah. themselves. Um, I think it's amazing what you did. I saw the picture of everybody at City Hall. I felt terrible that I got tied up in clinic and couldn't come, but kudos to you for not only doing the work, but taking time to celebrate what's been done. Because I think a lot of times when we're working too hard, we forget to celebrate the successes. So that's fabulous. And it's amazing to hear about all the leadership work that's been done. That was done during a time when we were, uh, tr you know, imagining what we would need to be in case we needed to do more things, more complicated things. So how timely was all that leadership development work to become the leaders um, in, in the area? And that has put, put to amazing use. And it just shows that we always need to be thinking ahead and not be satisfied to where we are. Um, my three uh, uh, questions uh, that remain are these. One, how is the new public health alert on the pause on the Johnson and Johnson vaccine going to affect our clinics. I did see that they're swapping to Moderna at the Fidelity. So that's number one. Number two, I don't know that we've done in-home vaccinations before. Um, and I know Helm Health and Hospice has a tremendous amount of experience about what happens for safety purposes and when it gets icy, having yak tracks for the nurses going into all these different places so i would love to see or, or somebody to comment on what we're doing to you know think about what we need to do about safety and protocols for people going into the home and being safe um and reporting things if they don't think they're safe and then lastly whenever there's construction we know that there can be uh aspergillus different molds that uh come up what role, if any, do we have, not in our own renovations for the uh, health department, but in the uh, wonderfully interesting to seven-year-old boys mess that is now Main Street at the former site of Alex? And now I'll, I'll step away. Um, sure, so I can answer the Johnson & Johnson question. So we got the notification yesterday um, and our clinic today was meant to be Johnson & Johnson. Um, so we um, secured Moderna through this, the state, um, notified all of the people who had signed up um, and let them know they could still come and get their vaccine and we were switching to Moderna. Um, so for now, until the state says otherwise, we won't be offering Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, and we'll just be securing Moderna or Pfizer through the state. Um, and I believe the state is waiting for the CDC to come out um, on, in regards to their investigation. Um, and then the second question in regards to the homebound clinics and the safety protocols. So um, we are working closely with home health and hospice. Um, we meet with them every week and we talk about, you know, the, the homebound patients and they have their own list of homebound patients and then people who aren't connected via through their services already are the ones who are receiving the homebound services from us. Um, so we are, we are sharing with them. Um, I would have to specifically 
um, talk to Bobby to see what the exact safety protocols are. That as are being long used. as you're in communication, that, that answers my question. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then the third question, um, uh, Bob, do you have any response to that question? Uh, could, could you repeat exactly what you were looking for there, uh, Dr. Well, Wolf? I guess, I guess the, Randy, the back, the welfare officer. Uh, this is Dr. Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum again. Uh, clarification, maybe we need to wait for Ren, but um, I know that uh, when the hospital had renovations, we had to be very careful about, uh, you know, things being stirred up, aspergillus or other, you know, pathogens, uh, chemicals, anything that might be stirred up by the destruction uh, of the Alex building in preparation for the art center. And I just didn't know if we as Board of Health had any involvement in that or if that was part of any protocol that we were uh, informed about or helping to inform. Yes. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not aware of, of any of that communication outside of possibly environmental health. So again, as, as Angela said, it may be something, or as you had mentioned, uh, Dr. Wolf, it may be something to inquire through uh, environmental health. I'm sure, you know, all the whatever permits, et cetera, they need through code uh, building department over at City Hall, have, all that stuff has been done and they secured sidewalks and things like that. So, but it's a good question. Maybe Ren could just get back to us at some point when he's available. Okay. Yeah, so there might be several questions that come up today that me and Bob aren't able to answer. So I'll just keep a list of them and then I'll reach out to the appropriate people afterwards and um, CC the board. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Anyone else that could, would like to comment on this at the moment? Director's report. I have a question. This is um, Alder Woman Elizabeth Liu. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two questions. The 15,000, I, I just didn't catch what that was. Is that, um, could you just, what was the 15,000 hours? The 15,000 hours was the um, total number of staff hours worked throughout the course of the pandemic year. So March 2020 to March 2021. So that's on the COVID uh, responses? On COVID Response. response only, yeah. And okay. that includes staff the division and then our surge staff as well. Okay. And just a follow up, um, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I know that uh, stipends were announced for first responders. And at that time, they weren't included. Uh, they, there wasn't any consideration uh, for a stipend for healthcare workers. And did that change at some point? So um, healthcare workers, I'm not sure about, but with public health workers, um, we have oh, yeah, stipends yeah. for um, overtime hours that we worked, um, even if you were not an hourly person. So we have received some stipends in regards to overtime COVID hours. Okay, so it was for overtime only. Okay, and could I just follow up because I, uh, I don't know if this will come up uh, later, but um, well, I don't know if it's related to the director's report. Let me wait and see if it comes up later. Thank you for your answers. Can I add something? Please do. Uh, so one of the things that the state was doing uh, during uh, lockdowns uh, and, and afterwards for a period of time was they were providing healthcare workers uh, extra stipend hours for direct exposure time where they were face to face with uh, patients. So that that was happening, but it was a program that healthcare providers were applying and documenting directly to the state to get reimbursement for. Yeah, I yes, I haven't heard that, but um, I mean, our workers at Dartmouth are, if it's on a weekend, they've been volunteering, both docs and uh, staff. If it's during the weekday, I think it's an exchange if the department can handle the specific staff member not being available and because of we're down in terms of numbers being seen that they've, they've been volunteering at the various clinics, but otherwise I don't think they're getting direct compensation in terms of financial reimbursement. So I have a question yes. on that. Uh, Elizabeth Liu, um, Ward Alderman. Um, Miss, uh, sorry, 
did you, when you said um, staff members that volunteer or um, or devote their hours to that, did you mean health department staff? No, sorry, it's my uh, Chuck Capetta, pediatrician at Dartmouth Hitchcock. So it's um, okay. It's mostly okay. the Dartmouth team. That specifically on pediatrics, we had a staff member that spent the whole day yesterday at Sears, the Sears building, where they're now doing some okay. vaccines, and it was interesting to hear all the all that. So, but I I will. To be fair, I thought she was just being sent there because one, she wanted to, but in exchange for her work day, which we didn't really need her yesterday in the office. So it was kind of a okay. one for one switch. Well, I, part of what I'm trying to um, figure out is, I know for some people, um, overtime is what they, work, what they hope for. Yeah. And are the public health workers getting all the overtime that they hope for? Bob? Yes, this is Bob Mack, the welfare officer. I I would suggest that they're getting more overtime than they would hope for um, at this point. I know a lot of staff have been working, uh, as, as Angela had mentioned, the 15,000 uh, hours. Um, you know, a lot of people are working even outside of their primary roles within the division. You know, that includes... Uh, you know, community services staff, environmental health staff, and welfare staff, along with the community health um, staff. So I would say there's there's ample opportunity um, for overtime, and there are a lot of uh, full-time salaried staff people that have been working additional hours as just part of their day-to-day -day normal operations as a salaried employee. So I, I believe some of the stipends um, were I don't want to say sporadic, but they, it's not like a consistent thing that, that all people are getting all sorts of overtime pay. Um, but again, more the, the details of that, neither myself nor Angela really have the details of all that at this point in time, but we can, we can uh, reach out to director Bagley and see if there are more specifics that she could answer. Okay. Does that help? Oh, Alderman Lou, is that okay? Is that fair? We'll reach back out to Bobby. And Alderman Lopez, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just, is it fair to say that probably nobody hopes for overtime where you have to dress head to toe in PPP and then stand in a garage for 12 hours trying to help people manage traffic and, and, and get things stuck up their nose? It's not in the average job description. Well, good point, but... I think it's amazing just to see how many good hearted people we have in this world and this community. So it's amazing to see all the, all the hard effort. So yes, Bob. I don't, I don't think it's being done for overtime purposes. I think people in the public health department genuinely want to see Nashville yeah. be safe and healthy. And right. I appreciate all the extra work they've been putting into that. Uh, thank you for that, Alderman Lopez. And I, I would just also add that there are a significant amount of volunteers that have stepped up and have been coordinated uh, to support the community, to support the division, to support the hospitals throughout this event. So it's been a pretty spectacular uh, community response. And I know United Way of Greater Nashville, for example, has helped uh, to coordinate a number of those volunteers, but I'm, I'm sure there are many volunteers that have just stepped up on their own and have reached out to these organizations, both medical professionals and um, I guess, lay people for, for lack of a, a better term that just want to volunteer and, and help out however they can. So it's been pretty spectacular. I'd like to uh, just respond to uh, Alderman Lopez comments if I could. This is Elizabeth Liu. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I in, in no way suggested that um, the motivation of the public health care workers was, you know, um, monetary. I was trying to make a point that um, if the opportunity for overtime is there, um, uh, my thoughts are, I know that we use some of our police, uh, fire, uh, fire, uh, work fighters. They're probably the highest paid people in the city or, uh, you know, higher than, uh, many. And my thought was not that, you know, I want to say that, uh, public health, workers are, you know, grabbing for cash and that's the only 
motivation. My point is, this is their op- this should be their opportunity to um, make as much overtime as they want to. Um, it sometimes makes a difference in your retirement um, situation, and I thought you would have understood that because I had asked about the stipend for them. Um, the last I knew, there was no stipend, and when I brought that up, I was concerned about that. That uh, they were the ones on the front lines, um, along with uh, fire and police, but there had been at the beginning no stipend um, considered for them. So yeah, I wasn't I wasn't um, suggesting that they were uh, grubbling for just money, and I was just concerned about where the overtime is being. Uh, who has the opportunity for this? Thank you. This, this was before your term, uh, Alderman Lou, but uh, most of the health department is not on a union and they're not going to receive a stipend or, or um, pension. So, I mean, getting more over it, over time now isn't going to help them in the long run at all. Well, good information. So thank you in the interest of time. But thank you. I think we'll have Bob and Angela reach back out to Bobby and she can at the next meeting, you know, clarify Alderman Lou, any any details that we're perhaps not able to answer today, but I, I, I agree, all good points. So um, let's see. The next, any public comments from our <clears throat> excuse me from our public list, listening in? I don't know. Okay. So community health is next in line. So here we have the community health report. Um, so we continue with our disease investigation, contact monitoring activities that takes up a significant amount of time um, on the community health side. Um, so Kim just has some data points here. So on March 1st, our percent positivity rate was 4.2%. And by March 31st, it had risen to 8.3%. Um, for an average of about 6.5% across the whole month. Um, and then in regards to new COVID cases, in the month of March, we had 536 new cases or about 134 new cases per week. And we reached out and um, conducted an interview with approximately 60% of those cases in the month of March. Um, and then also during the month of March, 31 COVID-19 vaccine clinics were held in the region, um, we vaccinated approximately 5,683 individuals just in the month of March, um, including the most at risk in our community. Uh, four per diem RNs were hired um, for the vaccination clinics under the FEMA vaccine grant. Um, uh, the public health nurse manager also coordinates and vets approximately 150 vaccine clinic volunteers. Um, and then community health continues their regular scheduled services, um, which are SANA, um, so syringe distribution. Um, and then we have immunization program. Um, and so these were, there were nine clinics where other non COVID-19 immunizations were offered. Um, and sh they were able to vaccinate 38 people. 14 children, 24 adults. Four of those were held at Elm Street Middle School. Um, and then five were at the public health library or the public library. And then four were at Lamprey um, for STD clinics where Hep A, Hep B, and HPV vaccines were also offered. Um, here are all the lists of the vaccine clinics that were completed in the month of March including the number of doses that were provided. And then we have our community health workers um, who assist with the immunization clinics and the um, testing clinics and also scheduling vaccine appointments and doing disease investigations. And then in regards to the STD HIV Hep C program. Um, outreach continues at the National Public Library in Leighton House. Um, and then we have our weekly clinic at Lamprey. Um, we're continuing to receive state and provider referrals for STD treatments, especially syphilis. And then we continued our chlamydia and gonorrhea, or we, we started up our chlamydia and gonorrhea um, 
testing, which had not been available since November of 2020. And then in regards to communicable disease, um, we continue to monitor our clusters, outbreaks, and watch lists, which are places of high potential of spread for COVID-19. So there were uh, four clusters and outbreaks in the month of March and 62 congregate settings that were investigated. Um, and then we continue with the disease investigation and, and contact monitoring. And I believe that is it for the community health report. Thank you. We'll offer Angela some water for you at the end. Uh, <laughs> all the talking that you're doing, my goodness. So well done. It's Chuck Capetta, Pediatrics or Board of Health member. Can I ask about the outreach? Can, I don't know where Leighton House is. I seven. should know it, but Sweet, where is right? that? Is that from the St. Joe's mini bus that goes around? Is that what goes to the public library? Um, that's our van. Oh, that's um, your yes. We have our own outreach van. Yeah. I don't know specifically where Leighton House is. Bob, do you know? I, yeah, I can answer that. The Leighton House, <laughs> yeah. is the, it's the rooming house up at the uh, uh, top of Main Street across from the Dunkin' Donuts on Canal Street. Yes. It's also known as Railroad Square. Yep. Um, okay. And that's a rooming house of approximately, I want to say like 60 or so. I'm, I'm not sure the exact number. I think it's like 60 or 70 uh, single room occupancy uh, units in there. That's a good place to do some outreach. Oh, I bet. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you much. Any comments? Yes. Alderman Lopez, thank you. Uh, two questions. Um, first, are we kicking off our Lyme disease uh, prevention awareness uh, campaign? And then second, um, is the Johnson & Johnson uh, pause going to significantly impact any of our clinics? Because I believe we're not, I think we're are we doing Moderna or Pfizer? So um, I can answer the Johnson Johnson question first. So um, we are doing Moderna at today's clinic, which was originally meant to be Johnson and Johnson. Um, and the state has um, not indicated that we wouldn't receive any further vaccine um, in regards to Moderna and Pfizer. Um, and then in regards to the Lyme disease question, um, yes, that's a health promotion question. So she has a schedule um, of all the upcoming public health education promotion things that are going on. Um, I haven't seen any Lyme disease posts as of yet, um, but I will check with Nicole and see when um, her Lyme disease promotional materials start. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, any comments? So I have a question. Yes. Um, it's fantastic that you include all the things that you have continued despite the 15,000 hours of COVID. Are there any um, concerns that you have about ongoing activities that we have not either been able to keep up due to staffing redeployed or redirected at COVID versus that patients are not arriving for their, you know, fill in the blank flu shot. I mean, it's past flu season now, but other health maintenance issues, because this is definitely a concern across the country and across the world that people are, you know, afraid to pursue their health issues or are just so overwhelmed by the uh, necessities uh, you know, trying to pursue the process, you know, the necessities of housing, food, job, children at home, et cetera. So I just wanted to get a sense from, uh, you know, a more uh, global perspective, if you have concerns about things that need, will need attention. Hello. Oh, just... Yeah, so I know um, when our STD services were opened back up, what? in I believe it was the summer we opened those back up. They were well received by the community and we have had um, people who continue to come to those on a weekly basis. So that was really nice for community health to have that um, support from the community and to have people to continue to go um, to those clinics. Um, and then also having the outreach portion also adds a nice element because we can go out into the community and we don't have to rely on clients coming to us for services. Um, in regards to things that may have 
sort of dropped off. Um, I know it's been difficult to conduct home visits um, with COVID, specifically in regards to lead and asthma. Um, and that's something that we have to um, figure out moving forward, what that's going to look like, what home visiting is going to look like um, in the future. But I can um, reach out to Kim specifically and ask her as well what she thinks. I just don't want to lose that thread. Yeah. Great, great question. Thank you. Thank you. I could also add uh, just briefly, I think Angela did a great job summarizing that and responding to that. In addition, I think that, you know, as the chief public health strategist, we strive to maintain community partnerships and we have, you know, worked closely with the other healthcare providers in the community to make sure that some of the folks are staying connected to primary health care, which is of utmost importance as well. Um, a lot of the folks that may be focused on with some of these outreach efforts may be connected to St. Lamprey or to the Harbor Care uh, Health and Wellness Clinic. So just, uh, and, and I know those organizations have done a tremendous job keeping up with, with their services as well as, as best they can. So. Great. No, oh, and I and echo that too for pediatrics specifically. We've no, we've just realized that we have nationwide to drop the ball with kids and because parents weren't coming in. So we're now advocating and really calling these families that we put on hold that you know it's not over, but we can have you safely in the building and really get these disease get these um, other vaccines under uh, under two given to their their kids. But there was such a reluctance to come into the building. So uh, thank you. Uh, Stephanie for bringing that to our attention. That's very true. But I imagine for adults too, for even like, you know, prostate screening, breast screening, mammograms, all these things that we have to be aware of as adult care providers that I think are probably put on back the back burner. We have to have our community partners make sure they're being pursued. Yes, and I think from a public health perspective, we need to recognize uh, and continue to work with our community partners so that we're coordinating that, that the downstream of the pandemic, having nothing to do with oh, the COVID the infections or the people that get the long haul, yeah, well, but all the people who couldn't get their elective surgeries and are suffering with their joints. And I mean, a lot of things were shut down. They weren't bringing people in for their routine you know, screening mammograms and different kinds of tests that were set aside because we didn't have the PPE. We didn't, you know, understand the virus and people needed to be deployed to emergency treatment. Um, we, you know, that's something that we, as, as a healthcare system, need to pay close attention to going forward. Yep. Perfect. Oh, I know. So, any comments there? Seeing none, I will. Go back now. Oh, it's know, now you're on the hot seat one more time for your special. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you. So the epidemiologist report. Um. So I have a uh, current situational update. So as of today, we have 137.5 million cases worldwide. 31.3 million of those are in the U.S. with 563,000 U.S. deaths. In regards to community level transmission here in Nashua, we are currently exceeding one out of two indicators that push us into substantial transmission. So we've had 486.8 new cases per 100,000 people, which is up about 40 standardized cases compared to last week. And then our percent positivity rate has remained where it was uh, over the past week. So in the past week, there has been 412 tests conducted on average each day in Nashua, and 33 of those tests have been positive each day, which gives us a percent positivity rate of 8.1%. And this is compared to the state's rate of 5.3%. Then in regards to our case activity, there are currently 7,408 cumulative cases in Nashua, and of those cases, approximately 227 are currently active and infectious. We have had no additional deaths in Nashua over the past week, for 83 total deaths and a case fatality rate of 1.1%. And then our hospitalization rate here in Nashua is at 1.9%, compared to the state's rate of 1.4%. And then last week in Nashua, we had 198 new cases, which is up about 10 cases compared to the week before. So over the past week, we've experienced a 5.3% increase in cases 
compared to the state's increase of 11 percent. Uh, in regards to Massachusetts, case activity has begun to plateau a bit. They have 35,000 active cases and they're seeing about 1.5 thousand new cases a day and their hospitals remain stable. And then in regards to the rest of the country, activity increase are, increases are sporadic across the country with the most significant increases seen in Montana and Puerto Rico. And then many southern midwestern states have started to decrease in regards to new cases per day. In regards to the variants, um, the CDC will no longer be reporting on the actual number of variant cases in the state as the numbers are meant to be used for surveillance purposes only and are not a great indicator of what exactly the case counts are. Um, so they will be reporting out on the percentage of the variants that we're seeing. So in New Hampshire, 21.4% of our variant cases yeah, are B117, 0.4% are P1, and then we have not yet seen B1351. About 75% of our variant cases in New Hampshire are other lineages um, that are being considered variants of interest, but not yet of high concern. Um, and then, um, so as an aside to the situational update, um, we have met with DHHS to discuss the variants of concern in Nashua um, and also vaccine breakthrough. So we do have both B117 and P1 variant here, cases here in Nashua, um, and we will be notified when one of these cases occurs. Um, but in regards to the vaccine breakthrough, there have been the three confirmed cases of vaccine breakthrough in New Hampshire, and those are the cases that have the positive lab um, dated 14 days post full vaccination. So any suspect vaccine breakthrough cases that we have here in Nashua will require a full investigation, um, which includes genome sequencing if appropriate. Um, so our disease investigations will, disease investigators will conduct those um, full investigations of vaccine breakthrough. Um, and then in regards to vaccinations, so by the end of March, uh, 9,101 residents in Nashua had been fully vaccinated, meaning that they received two doses of Pfizer or Moderna or one dose of Janssen, and 19,167 Nashua residents had received at least one dose of Pfizer or Moderna. Um, so this is the total vaccinations given by us or by some other provider. Um, so it means that at the end of March, approximately one out of every three national residents had received at least one dose of vaccine. I can't get there. It just comes up with um, And then in regards to epi non-COVID activities. So in the month of March, we held our annual PM slide training with the staff. Um, and we have also been moving forward with our internal and external strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats assessment and analyzing those results. Um, and then in regards to our community health improvement plan, we held the prioritization meeting with our community partners um, where we presented the data from the CHA and asked, to, asked them to prioritize health areas. So after analyzing this prioritization, our 2021 CHIP health priority areas will be behavioral health, maternal child health, communicable disease, chronic disease, and public health emergency preparedness. And then social determinants of health, health equity, and adverse childhood experiences will be overarching goals um, that get addressed under each priority area. Um, this is the first time that we've had communicable disease as a priority area. Um, so we're looking forward to launching a new group um, to get started on that work. Um, and that's it for the EPI report. It's just, you know, oh, thank you very much. My goodness. You uh, option or something. Stephanie, you had your hand up there briefly. Yes, I do have a couple of questions. Angela, this is an astounding amount of work. Uh, we're so grateful to have you. Two questions. One, the vaccine numbers that you provided, does that include the numbers of healthcare workers that were vaccinated at their healthcare institutions? Yes, if they live in Nashua, yes. If they live elsewhere but work in Nashua, it does not include them. Thank you so much. Wow. And then regarding the breakthrough cases, oh, maybe, um, yeah. how were they discovered? Were these people mildly asymptomatic? And has it followed like the science it, that we today. know so about the it. rare breakthrough cases where they have the mild yeah, to moderate like to disease the and are not it's hospitalized or in critical condition? So in yeah. order to get well, recognized by us, they would have to seek COVID testing. So if their COVID tests, if they're fully vaccinated and they have the sniffles, they might not go get a COVID test because they think that they're 
they're not going to get COVID. But if they do seek the COVID test and it's within two weeks of their second dose or first dose of Janssen, then um, they would be flagged as a potential vaccine breakthrough and then we would have to conduct the full investigation. But you said these cases were already plus 14. Yeah, so the ones, the three ones that exist, um, they they were tested, um, and and there's other. These aren't in Nashua, so these are state cases that we were informed about. Um, so I'm not sure about the exact um, case details if they were asymptomatic or symptomatic. Um, but regardless, if someone was undergoing routine testing and then they came back positive, we would still conduct the investigation. Anyway, but I think with a dog in there, she just feels okay. Thank you. Great. I don't know. Um, Alderman so, Lopez, thank you. I would like. Uh, yeah. So my niece had one of the unfortunate distinctions of being one of the first youth cases in the state. Um, so my question is, if you had somebody who was double vaccinated and then um, did contract COVID or contracted COVID multiple times um, and was in the school system, would there be would would our health department be informed of that? Would the school be informed of that? Would there be that knowledge now that we're opening up schools? Sitting there going. Yes. So if they if they tested positive again, we would be notified. Um, just like we're notified with all positive cases. Um, and then we would continue to do the um, investigation and the contact tracing and figuring out who was exposed to the individual. Okay. Thanks. And in the interest of public health that we all like to think oh, yeah. that no, everything I, I initiative we do I, is always going to be 100 percent accepted by everything we want to have happen have you in this mode yeah I know. there's a well, growing resistance movement right. appearing that you know right. vaccine the non-vaccinators for covid you like know, everything else are coming up to roost here like in the granite state so yeah, I mean, if we, especially parents which i find is mind-boggling to me but um, I don't have anything of kids there, uh, that I see. Have you, Angela, or any of your colleagues had a pushback or on the front line? Or do we, should we as a department or a group think about either marketing or what other messages can we get out there that now that more people are going to be seen as having it, having it they're going to pull their masks down and things like that. But most importantly, they're not going to go for the vaccine. So what can we do to make sure that message is still strong? But still, you know, yeah, we had this conversation a little bit yesterday when we were talking about how to deal with the Johnson and Johnson kind of flashback. Right. Um, so we um, right now yeah. our plan to deal with vaccine hesitancy you know, is our community health workers and going out into the community and having conversations with people who might be hesitant. Um, but to know for sure um, what the plan is, Nicole, our health promotion and communication specialist is um, kind of the go-to one in regards to vaccine hesitancy. Um, so I will reach out to her and um, ask her yeah, question. Right. Yes, no, thank you. If you could just bring that back to the group, that'd be great. Yeah. And then, you know, um, Alderman Lopez. Um, just a trivia question, I guess. Um, do you know whether or not uh, the staff of public health have been vaccinated or if there are any that are declining to do it? All right. Okay. Yep. You too. Um, so our staff has been offered vaccines um, and the majority of our staff have been vaccinated. Um, and so Bobby keeps track of the people who have been fully vaccinated or partially vaccinated um or not okay i realize i'm kind of straying into hipaa slash hr things i was just curious if we had a 100 percent or something like that but okay thank you. thank you well great report thank you very much for all that wonderful data um let's see do we have a emergency preparedness report or do we want to we can move that on to next time or if we don't um yeah i do believe he has a report i don't know if i have it um, pulled up, but his activities have been 100% um, vaccine and testing clinics. So we have all the vaccine clinics that we've discussed, um, the equity clinics that we've discussed, um, managing those volunteers um, and kind of just coordinating all those activities. It's a lot of moving parts, um, but that's really what's going on in the, the FEP Thank world you. for us. That works. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent summary. Um, health promotion and communications. All right, health promotion. 
Okay. So Nicole, our health promotion communication specialist, um, has her COVID activity. So she's part of the Joint Information Center. Um, and she uh, works to continue to push out the newsletter on a weekly basis, updating partners on our uh, COVID response and activities. Um, we continue our public health radio hour and our, also our public health matters TV show every week. Um, she's been working um, at the vaccine clinics and then with our community health workers. Um, there are some great videos that have been put out with our community health workers talking about vaccine and vaccine hesitancy in their native languages um, and pushing those out to um, their contacts. Um, so that's a really great resource that we're excited about. Um, to have, and that happened in the month of March as well. Um, and so in April, oh, here we go, Tom, here's the answer to your question. So we have STD Awareness Month, yes. Child Abuse Prevention Month, World Autism Month, Child Injury Prevention, Lead Poisoning Prevention, and then Tick and Lyme Prevention will also be coming up in the month of April. And then Nicole coordinated our Public Health Week, which was a fantastic um, week. So there was a lot of activities going on. We had the award ceremony, um, which was wonderful. And then we also had our um, walking challenge. So we had uh, 120 participants from across the city um, participate in our walking challenge. Um, and um, people got very competitive. So it was really, it was a fun thing to do. Um, and then we also had outreach tables available throughout the week at the mental health center, um, Harbor Care, Nashua Pal, um, Revive, the Adult Learning Center, the United Way, and the Public Library. Um, and these tables had little giveaways and also information about Public Health Week and, and other public health information. Um, and then she also wrote an article for NHPHA, the New Hampshire Public Health Association, in their newsletter on Public Health Week. Um, and then Nicole also works on our Community Health Improvement Plan and our Community Health Assessment, so that work is ongoing. Um, and then she worked on a Facebook ad to promote our child immunization clinics. Um, she's also promoting child lead poisoning prevention and blood lead level testing. Um, and then also she's running a mental health campaign, Change Direction, Five Signs of Emotional Wellbeing from May to June. Um, and these are just pictures of her work down below. Thank you, Angela. Fantastic stuff, as always. Every every department is so amazing, so wonderful. Um, any comments, Dr. Wolf Rosenblum? Mental health. We know many people are struggling due to the pandemic and the downstream from the pandemic. It's spring. People are out. Whether everybody's vaccinated or some subset, we we think that we hope that things are you know at a simmer and and not as bad as they were last year when we had less understanding of the virus and less, you know, understanding of how to treat people that get sick, et cetera. I just would like to put in a notation, not necessarily needing to be answered now, that I wanna make sure that we keep mental health uh, as a priority, um, not only because as we emerge from this and people are grateful to be alive, then reality sets in for a lot of people. A lot of kids that weren't in school, uh, especially, you know, the adolescents that didn't have this socialization. Um, I know we usually do something in October, um, you know, uh, but I just want to keep that top of mind. And then as a corollary to that, I see that in English. I know that threaded throughout some of these reports have been making sure that we have these messages, not only in different languages, but also culturally sensitive messaging. And I know that the minority ethnic communities, immigrant communities are, are especially suffering during these times. And I just wanna make sure that, uh, I know the, the amount of work you're accomplishing is unbelievable, but that we're engaging as many partners as we can, as we can and engaging those, uh, uh, communities in a health equity fashion to make sure that we're also meeting their mental health needs during this challenging time. Thank you. I keep filing. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. So I just took some notes while you were talking, um, just so I can communicate with Nicole. Um, but yeah, the, the cultural competence 
messages and, and messaging in different languages is a huge priority for us. And we really have expanded in that capacity in our with our four new community health workers. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what materials are available in our other languages. Um, so I would have to connect with Nicole to know for sure, but we have been prioritizing, making sure that our messaging and then also our surveys um, to the community are available in Spanish, Portuguese, French, um, Swahili, all the languages that we that we can push that information out in. Thank you. Well, well put, thank you. And then any other comments there before we go to our last partner here who hasn't, who needs to now pick up his game now, boss, because your colleague has been talking all day. Yeah. So let's let's make it a good one. And then we get to vote. I, I just thought I'd let Angela do my report as well, since she's yeah. been doing such a fabulous job on all these other reports, but it's okay. I will uh, take the opportunity to do the welfare report. Uh, Bob Mack, Welfare Officer for the City of Nashua. This is just a report out for the month of March in the Welfare Department. You can see a slight uptick in uh, shelter assistance in comparison to, to last year at this time. I think there's been a primary focus on keeping people housed during the, throughout this event. Um, what happened in mid-March was the introduction of the new emergency assistance funding program. Uh, kind of similar, it's a, a continuation, if you will, of the previous emergency assistance program that was running through the CAP agencies. So um, in mid-March, March 15th, they started taking applications again for that the, the new emergency assistance program which is being uh, managed by New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority and operating once again through the, the CAP agencies throughout the state. So in our region, uh, we are referring folks to Southern New Hampshire Services to apply for that program. If they have any COVID related financial uh, hardships, they can apply through that. So we are expecting for this upcoming month that a, a lot of our folks, and we're already seeing it, are being referred over there. Typically, um, the month of April in the welfare department is a little slower because people are getting their income tax refunds typically. And again, with the introduction of some stimulus funds and these other programs, um, we're expecting a, a down, downward uh, turn in the, the request for assistance through the municipal welfare office. But again, uh, looking at March, we've seen a slight increase since in compared to the previous year. Uh, the number of contacts, one of our staff people, her primary uh, her, one of her, her primary responsibilities has shifted from welfare to helping with a lot of these equity clinics. And she's had a lot of volume and contacts there. So if you look at page two, you'll notice our contact number uh, is very significant. And a lot of that is related to uh, those equity clinics and, and her work on that. Uh, but in addition, people are still calling our office, asking about assistance and asking about programs. And, and we're referring a lot of folks, as I mentioned, over to Southern New Hampshire services. Um, we continue to do our work with our community partners and nonprofit agencies. Um, to date, uh, as of the date of this report, excuse me, uh, we had expended around $307,000 of our uh, general assistance budget, which is about 57% of that budget for fiscal year 21. So we're in pretty good shape in that regard. As I mentioned, we're expecting to see um, a slight downtick in, in the request for assistance over the next month or so, uh, which is somewhat typical, but again, in, in uh, response to the programs that have been implemented, uh, those are going to help out a lot of folks within our community. That being said, I don't know if there are any questions on that report. No, thank you. I have a question, Elizabeth Lewis. I had a question you had included, Bob, a general fund. We were, were we supposed to do something with this? There was all these details, or is that just a general fund appropriation detail? Do you know what we got? Why we got that? Is that, I think that might be the budget. Oh, okay. To share that. Okay. Um, oh, the proposed budget. I part said. of the proposed budget. So okay. that's where, where um, as far as the general assistance budget for yeah. welfare, we are requesting a, a little bit less. In, in that budget for this year, uh, we think we'll be in pretty good shape. So we were able to, to um, decrease that primarily in the shelter assistance line, which is our, our largest line item. Right. Um, and it's 
one, because of all these programs, two, um, there are some other mainstream programs throughout the community that have, have come into play. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any comments? I think there was another question from Alderman Lou. I'm sure she's still on, so. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Sorry. Hello? Hello. Oh, sorry. Um, I was pressing the wrong button. What is an equity clinic? The, the equity clinic is the vaccine clinic that was focused on um, identifying some of uh, the minority populations to make sure they had opportunity to have access to the vaccines because they were identified as those that are um, less likely to access these services. And I don't know, Angela, is that, do you have a, a better description for that? Yeah, so it's, it's really meant for our um, people who are experiencing homelessness, our Black, um, our BIPOC, our, um, and other peoples of color. Uh, I can't remember the acronym. Black Indigenous. Black Indigenous and other peoples of color. Peoples of color, I think is yeah. what it's for, yes. Population. <laughs> um, and uh, Hispanic and Latino population. Um, and just so people who um, would have difficulty accessing services for whatever reason are uh, afforded that opportunity um, specifically just for them. So those clinics are on Fridays. Just to add to that, Alderman Lou, one of the things that um, has been challenging with our vaccine distribution is that, it, you know, not everybody has a car to drive over to the high school, not everybody has a computer to get on the VMs or now the New Hampshire vaccines.org to, to schedule things. And, and so, you know, we want to make sure that all populations have access. Thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. So anything else before we open up the meeting to public comments? Otherwise, we need we to work on the budgets or that was that just informational? Um, I believe those were summarized in the top of Bobby's report. Um, okay, yes, that's, maybe that's what I was referring to. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Okay, well, our um, this time it's about 1.35 and we have hopefully maybe two or three still wonderful Nashua residents online. Any comments from you guys? Otherwise, we're going to vote to adjourn. I have a discussion meeting. item. Yes. Um, I don't want to preempt public comment, but um, we had talked last month about at least identifying criteria and figuring out what it would look like to uh, address the masking um, ordinance. Well, I understand that the state ordinance currently take precedent because the governor has not released that. and. Um, also from a health perspective with, you know, changes in vaccine distribution and multiple variants, you know, impacting different communities. This isn't the time itself to be looking at uh, removing masking expectations. I do think it would be a good idea to get started on what that would look like from a health perspective, um, specifically identifying criteria such as um, reduction or having X number of people in the city identified as vaccinated or, um, you know, if there's a surge beyond different points, um, I'm kind of imagining something similar to the way the, the school district did it. Um, and I'd rather that be guided by health oriented and health prioritized decision making. Now, that's a fair point. You know, I apologize. You're right. We did have the mask ordinance um, from last time. So I think given the forum size, I think if Angela, Bob, we could make this a priority for next time. I don't have, have any other comments apart from I think we just need more brain cells here and see what's what's been discussed. Yeah, and I wanted to make a point of commenting on it, but I also understand that the circumstances, even in just the last couple of days, have changed drastically and we are experiencing a surge. So yep, yep. No, that's fair. That's fair. So this is Dr. Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum, um, who keeps forgetting to introduce myself, even though I also to do it. Uh, Alderman Lopez, the, the thing I would say is that we should not just look to see what's in the community. Um, because we will never have 100% vaccination. Um, but we should also look at high, you know, what is considered to be low, medium, and high risk situations. So if you have a small enclosed space with poor ventilation, unless you plan to have, uh, you know, 
make sure that everybody's vaccinated and that their second vaccine was less than six months ago because we don't know how what the duration is at this point. Um, we really need to think about environmental driven uh, criteria as well. I agree. The mask ordinance does specifically identify uh, areas where social distancing is not possible. Um, I was more thinking in terms of making sure that if if the ordinance needs to be returned, if we if we drop the ordinance over the summer and then some even more virulent strain comes back, make sure that we have a condition for that and reasoning and grounds for it. And then more importantly, some way for the public to see and engage in the in how the decision is made in the first place, uh, just so that there's a little bit more buy-in. Yeah, fair point. And I realize that that environmental factors specific to an area are going to be a, a an element of that too. I just want to keep it on the radar so that the discussion is happening here and not politically. No. Perfect. Well put. Okay. And, um, anything else before we go to public comments? Seeing none. Um, can we, um, one, well, on behalf of Stephanie and I, we'll thank you very much for a great meeting. We will pass back to our fearless leaders what's happening. Thank you through Bob and Angela. And um, is it public comment time? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So um, I, uh, I am, can I make a comment? I'm oh, sorry I interrupted. Yes. Oh, no. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, my name is Marion Knight. I live at 29 Harris Street in Nashua. And um, I appreciate uh, Alderman Lopez for, again, bringing forth my request to set some criteria for the removal of the mask order. Um, because I, I personally disagree with it based on what I have seen. Um, so I. I think you're all well aware of my sentiments at this point. So I would just like to ask one question uh, and I would like to ask it on the record and I would like a response. So the question I have is, are you telling me that I, if I disagree with the mask order, um, that I have only two choices and it is to either put my own health at risk, which is what I believe um, the use of masks does put my health at risk, or to move away from the city of Nashua to somewhere that doesn't have a mask order. And I've lived in Nashua for 24 of my 67 years, so this makes me sad, but I will do it because if I have to, as it seems that the intent of the city is pretty much to keep people masked up. And thank you for responding, I hope, and uh, thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you for your input. Um, any comments that we can help here or? I don't think we're at that stage. I'm hoping you don't move out of Nashua, but um, I think we'll ever get to that. But I think we're, it's a, a rolling target, a moving target. And I think we're going to follow the science. We're going to follow the stats and the the reality of what this disease is showing. And so I, for one, would not be able to predict where we're going with this, apart from just our role as a part of health is to educate, inform. And after that, it is a personal choice. This is Dr. Stephanie Wolf Rosenblum. Thank you for your question and your input. It certainly would be no one's intention to create an environment where people feel unsafe. On the contrary, our purpose is to make sure people do feel safe. My background is as a board certified lung and intensive care specialist. And because I take my responsibilities to my patients, many of whom do have impaired respiratory situations, as well as to my role on the Board of Health very seriously. I have studied this and would be very interested in having you speak to a healthcare professional about your particular concerns 
about the mask and aspects of what mask is being used, how it's being used, and what risks you feel you're being put at because you should not feel that you are being put at risk. On the contrary, you should be feeling that we are uh, making recommendations to the Board of Aldermen to keep everybody safe. So um, I don't know if that addresses your concerns. Uh, we, as uh, uh, Alderman Lopez said, uh, are consistently scanning the literature. Um, we, I think we all hoped that we would not be recommending continuation of the mask mandate at this point. And certainly as pointed out today, the um, hard stop, uh, hopefully temporary, but the hard stop right now for the J&J &J vaccine concerns about the AstraZeneca vaccine, concerns about the variants, um, and concerns about post-vaccination infection have all factored into our recommendation that the mask mandate uh, continue. But it's something that we discuss uh, constantly uh, within the healthcare profession, within the Board of Health, and will continue to do so and would welcome an opportunity to hear your ideas about what those criteria might look like so that we continue to consider all aspects and all um, perspectives when making our recommendations. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, in the interest of time, so I have to run to the office, I'm going to ask that we take a, a, a vote, if that's all right, seeing other, no further comments, um, to adjourn this meeting at 1.45. Um, I see that. Thank you. Seconded. So thank you, everybody. We'll have our fearless leaders back, Bobby and Tony, next week, and you all did a great job. Thank you, Angela, for all your great reporting, Bob, and all your colleagues, and Dr. Wolf Rosenblue for your insightful information. Thank you much.